Good afternoon to everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Great pleasure to you seeing so many of you even on the second day after the very demanding evening. So my name is Jeremir, as I was introduced, and I am uh, the chair of uh, the IT and Smart City Committee of the City of Prague, more or less acting as the right hand of our Lord Mayor in some aspects. So please let me introduce our dear guests. Uh, first, I would like to introduce our Lord Mayor of the City of Prague, Mr. Zdenja uh, who has held the position of the mayor since November 2018. And a few words about him. He graduated from the third faculty of medicine at the Charles University in Prague originally, and then worked as project manager in the fields of medicine and IT. And has been, he has been also in charge of the Institute for Applied Research, Education, and Management on Medicine since 2012. Over the course of his career, he participated in several working groups focusing on IT and quality of service in governmental uh, areas, and he was also focusing on European and global levels in um, the management of medicine. And, which is, which is also interesting, he published a few articles in domestic and foreign media. As the mayor of the city of Prague, he is currently responsible for the areas of IT, security, European funds, and international relations. So, a warm welcome. Hello again. <laughs> Second, we have here Mr. Thomas van Oppens from the city of Leuven, who is acting as the vice mayor of the ICT for the city. And Thomas is a strong advocate for data-driven policies and open data. And one of his first actions on this topic was to share all of their city's available static data on centralized platform for be reusing by the general public. And he also added a standard open data clause to all the public procurement contracts, which I find quite exciting. And we are working on that too. <laughs> uh, Thomas is now working jointly with the cities of Bruges and uh, Roselare to build the city's first real-time data warehouse. And one of the first practical uses will be improving the so-called nudging techniques against nighttime noise. There are also many other interesting and fun facts, but what I would like to pinpoint is that they're uh, jointly with the university and uh, many other institutions working on citizen science projects, such as Telram, and which is a citizen science project to measure the nature and quality, a quantity of several transport modes. And they're running the Leuven.cool platform, which is a citizen science project to measure the urban heat effect and climate change. So a big clap for Thomas, please. And finally, online today, we have Mrs. Penelope Comitas, uh, who happens to be the deputy mayor of Paris. Hello to you, Penelope. And let me introduce her briefly. Um, Penelope, before being handed over the Innovation and Attractiveness Delegation, she used to be in charge of green spaces, biodiversity, urban agriculture, and funeral efforts for the city of Paris, which might sound uh, funny a little bit or interesting, but we also have this agenda uh, on um, our priorities list in Prague, and I would not underestimate it because um, funeral spaces and graveyards in general amount for a great share of every city's green areas. So this is why it is important and why it matters a lot. During Penelope's previous term, she um, was handed the delegation regarding disabled people, uh, following her lifelong associative commitment, which had brought her to be the Francis Greenpeace General Director for five years. So we might even talk a little bit about activism and how NGOs can cooperate with the governments, be it on the regional or national level. So once again, hello to Penelope and welcome to the panel. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. Now, since we are finding ourselves at the Prague City Data Congress, we obviously expect that we are going to be talking about data and open data in the first place. I don't want to steal any of the topics from our panelists, so let me shoot and start with the first question. Um, I was looking for a topic or an area of interest that would be common for the three of you, and I understand that one of these areas is citizen-centric approach, or if you want, focus on people, their needs and interest, as opposed to focus on problems and solution in the first place, which would be the quite traditional approach. 
Obviously, as we are sitting on this panel, um, let me start with the following question, which will be aimed at all three of you. How do you use the city data for the benefit of your citizens? And what have you learned in the process of implementation so far? And let me start with the lady, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, the city of Paris uh, um, has been a leader in open data, and I think that we initiated this policy uh, in 2010, and uh, um, we have already been publishing new data sets since then, increasing the transparency of the city's actions. That's very important. More and more of these data sets are released in real time. Uh, which requires an appropriate framework to share and uh, uh, visualize them. Uh, for this, we uh, rely on the Open Data Soft company, which has been working with us for 10 years to upgrade our open data platform. Um, new data releases are now most often associated with dynamic data visualizations that allow easy data analysis. And uh, we are regularly produce maps that accounts for our service to Parisians. And this is for us a major challenge that completes us to improve our services. Just one or two example, examples. Uh, well, we, you, you spoke uh, on my um, delegation before, but for example, Parisians are really fond of their trees and we have trees database. Uh, we, is database is one of the most downloaded data sets in the Par on, on the Paris open data. And this data is enabled to, to localize each trees and give information on their spices and size. It is um, uh, updated in real time and we regularly receive messages from Parisian. We discover uh, three, still the, the, the database is not being cut down. And uh, um, we also have a pillar of our mobility policy to encourage pedestrians, bicycle and soft mobility, which is a huge, um, issue regarding the um, COP21 issues and the, the climate. And uh, we, we have increased also the numbers of mobility sensors. And uh, we, are, we regularly test new sensor technologies to improve the monitoring of traffic and mode of transport. And uh, uh, to hand, we, um, uh, we also extend our data expertise in partnerships with the Parisian Innovation Ecosystem. Uh, in 2015, we launched an open innovation program, which is Data City. Uh, four data city classes have been organized with our municipal agents, uh, major urban service companies, startups, and, uh, and these challenges uh, allow us to work on concrete case studies to feed the municipal data platform that we're developing in open source. And I will stop you here because we will get to those topics later. Uh, I thank you very much for the great intro. I see that we really do have a lot in common be it the green areas or be it public transit or transit in general, this is the topic which probably joins all of the major European cities. Now, let me turn uh, to Leuven, and I would first want to ask Thomas if he could maybe in a few sentences describe this situation of the city of Leuven, because unlike Paris or Prague, uh, which all of the people around, I dare to say, uh, no, uh, Levin is a smaller city. It has a pop of around 100,000. Correct me if I'm wrong. And the situation Correct. might be very different. So how are you using the public data for the benefit of the citizens in your city? Hello. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks uh, for introducing me. Děkuji. Uh, Prosím. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm Thomas Lopens from Leuven. And Leuven is indeed a very small city compared to Prague, compared to Paris compared to many others. Um, but however, we try to take that as an advantage because the smaller scale allows you to do more. Paris is busy with being a 15-minute city, I heard, 
we're already a 15 minute city. <laughs> so it makes some things easier uh, because this is this lower scale. Uh, you, and also we have a big university within our city. We have 50,000 students who come to our city each year to study. Uh, compared to the 100,000 inhabitants, that's a big difference. But it's also a great advantage because it allows us to work closely together with them. And it's these close connections with universities uh, and also with companies that have allowed us to thrive in different fields, but also in the field of data. We were the winner of the uh, iCapital Award, we're the European Capital of Innovation, after already Barcelona and Paris, uh, I also think Amsterdam, I'm not sure, uh, got the, this award uh, in previous years. So we try to box above our level, as we say in, uh, in Dutch. And so on the terms of data, we, uh, we, we try to be look at very specific projects. We are not able to uh, make these huge platforms. That's not something that we can do at this time, but we can very specifically, and I will come back to that, try to solve problems of our citizens by using data. Uh, but that's, this way, is a, uh, it's a more smaller approach, but it allows us to find very intelligent solutions uh, for very real problems without actually ever having to start these very large and very high budget programs, uh, but still find solutions for our citizens, which is eventually the only thing our citizens ask. They do, very few citizens, you of course do that, but very few citizens ask me, Thomas, why is there not more open data? But they always ask, Thomas, I have a problem, why aren't you solving this? And so we're starting from that. So you know your problems and the problems of the citizens, which is great news, and I bet we have a lot to learn from the smaller cities as well. Now I will turn to uh, Lord Mayor, to Zdeněk Grzyb. Uh, obviously, do not think, please, everyone here, that I don't know the answers to this question, but I'm interested in Zdeněk's views of this topic. Well, uh, definitely we focus on a problem-oriented approach here uh, in Prague. Uh, so, for example, um, right now we have, uh, well, for example, there is a public discussion about the reasons of the traffic jams and so on in Prague, the congestions on the streets and so on. So, in this case, we do what we always do. That means that we look on what data is uh, available right now, uh, how can make how can we can make them accessible for the citizens and as open data and to support the public discussion based on the real facts. So for example, we had found that in fact we are collecting already data about the congestions for already one year, which is unfortunately the COVID year, so they are somehow of course, uh, affected in this way. But however, the data are being collected right now. So there is a plenty of data for basically any problem and 90% of the work is actually make the data comprehensible. So uh, that is basically the approach of the city of Prague. Now I uh, hear quite frequently that people do not care as much about data, they care about the real solution as Thomas suggested. So in what way do you present your open data to the general public and what would be the key feedback that you take from the people? So Yeah, let me get some examples because uh, what I just said, it's also something that Ben said in the beginning of yesterday's uh, day and it was continued uh, by all the speakers. They said, oh yeah, you need some end user thing and it depends of course who the end user is. Sometimes it's the citizens, but sometimes it's us policy makers. We are often end users because if we want to make a decision, for example, on uh, transport and mobility, well, it's very hard to make a decision if you don't have any information. And in the past, uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, our, our predecessors, they made decisions based on their gut feeling. That was, was, that was the way it was. Today we have an opportunity to make decisions based on real data. And we can say, okay, this is the effect. And then, for example, if I can continue on the mobility problem, we in Leuven, we also had our, have still have our mobility problems. Uh, and what we decided to do was uh, we cut our city in different pieces. And there's a ring road around the city, and you can only enter and leave through the ring road. So you can't go through the city anymore. It drastically lowered uh, traffic. But, of course, what are the effects? How much traffic, how, how much is it lowered? 
Today we have a, a system in place called Telram, and their international name is WeCount. It's a Leuven citizen science project that originated from within our city, and it's a small camera with AI in it that doesn't that just sensors how many cars, buses, bikes, uh, pedestrians pass by, also how fast they are going. It's great because it two things happen. First, it's open data, so everyone can seize it. Every citizen who wants to can put it on their window. It's also checked for privacy and everything. So that's a great system to, for citizens to know how busy is my street actually. And, uh, but it's also a great system for us because we know, oh, this street is very busy. While it's actually a street for people to live in, we need to do something about it. And we can go to the public and say, look, we are cutting the street in half. And with cutting the street, I mean, you can't pass through it with your car anymore because we sense there's too much traffic in here and we don't just feel it in our gut, but we show you the numbers and we say this is unlivable by our standards that we beforehand made up, um, uh, thought about. And afterwards, after the decision is made, half a year later, we can say, look at the data, thanks to our, uh, our, our decision, traffic has reduced 75%, for example. And the consequence is that by doing this systematically, Today in the city center of Leuven, we have a 50-50 modal split between cyclists and cars. And you do not count in the public transit? Uh, no, no. We also have a lot of public transit, but that's indeed uh, something else. But if you just look at cars and cyclists, it's like 50-50. Now, we have a very interesting case study in Paris, because you obviously made it to the headlines of many world newspapers with introducing the... 30 zone, 30 kilometers per hour zone all over the internal city. We are just talking about the metropolitan area of 2 million inhabitants, which is quite different compared, for instance, to our city, to the city of Prague, which is uh, almost the triple size to, to the center of Paris. Now, um, have you used some of the data that, that you collect over time to explain the need for such a measure to the citizens and um, do you sometimes feel it? maybe also in other areas the comfort, not the opportunity, but really the comfort of supporting your political decisions or policy making with the data that you have collected over time? Well, what we try to do, you know, is um, to to give the more more information as possible to the Parisian, which wants the, this uh, this uh, this informations. And uh, for example, this is a for us, this is a, a key factor in the service provide to the user. Uh, you know, I think that Parisians. Um, they no longer want to have to fill in the same information several times. Uh, they, they really expect us to make it easier uh, for them to find documents, uh, well, regardless of the administration that produce. And well, what we have done that is we have dev developed a user service, which is named in French Le Compte Mon Paris, which is uh, developed by, uh, by, by the City Hall, uh, which is connected um, to the France Connect National Services since uh, one year. Um, and this enables the application of one service approach. The Parisians who use this account no longer has to fill in the same administrative documents. Once they are logged in, they can find all the required documents and access history of all the data, you know, and I think that this is something very interesting. And what we also really proud is that this service, this account is also um, uh, a means of improve, improving accessibility that all connected Parisian services now meet accessibility standards, especially for the visually impaired people. And, um, and uh, we, we are continuing the work on this territorial platform with the objective of um, opening up our information systems. I'm very happy to hear that you do care a lot uh, for the disabled people or people with special needs because that is a huge topic for the future for us as well. I mean, in the city of Prague, we are so far quite happy to have introduced a few basic services or if you want the so-called one-stop shop that you were referring to. And uh, this might be our 
next homework to make it more open and easier to use. Can you confirm? Well, well, sure, there is a plenty of job to be done, but if I may follow on what Thomas said, uh, the problem is actually, uh, yes, the decision-based, uh, sorry, the, the database decision-making, but then you also need to do something like uh, data-based explaining or something like that. You have to explain the, the decisions to the public, and this is, of course, an uh, area for which you need uh, open and accessible accessible data and uh, uh, you have to transform them into information that is more accessible for uh, let's say non-IT population so that is why we for example started a website called Pragozor pragozor.cz which is basically a website which is taking various data from various sources not just our uh, municipal data platform, Galamio, but also other data sources, and transform them into a nice colored and interactive graphs, which um, makes it attractive for, uh, let's say, uh, BFU, I think is the, uh, is the term in IT, but uh, basically all users uh, who would like to see it and do not have uh, uh, statistical uh, a degree in statistics or something like that. So uh, that is something how we try to make the data more accessible to the public because we've got also a platform golemio.cz which is more oriented towards people who like to actually work with the open data on a, on a data level. Now let me uh, go a little bit further ahead and ask about uh, some topics that consider uh, everyday lives of every, bus, every one of us. You, all three of you, proudly declare that you take a great interest in climate issues, which are especially relevant today. So let me ask, uh, do you have any practical examples of how you use the data to improve uh, the care of green areas? And do you see any space for cooperation, for instance, with startups in this area. I can give one quick example. In Prague, as you might know, we have the seat of EU spy agency, previously GSA, which is responsible for satellite and navigation systems. And I know that there are many, really plenty of opportunities to start new startup companies who focus on agri-tech, who focus on monitoring the green areas and what the condition of the vegetation are. So, do you have anything like that in place in Paris, Penelope? Not really, you know, not for the moment. Uh, we work, we're really working on, on, on this. And, well, we're working also... Um, I spoke about the, the trees application that, that we have. And we have also, uh, for example, uh, application on uh, water flow and, um, and on, on traffic, uh, you know, um, uh, on traffic jam, which is uh, something important uh, for uh, implementing our urban policies. And uh, what we discover also is... Um, because I think that this is something quite a bit different about climate, but uh, we, we during the COVID um, uh, crisis, we, we, we discover that, you know, Paris is a, is a mix of um, uh, 17 uh, arrondissement districts. And um, we, we, we discover also that we need to strengthen the, 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 the a transversal co coordination of all our urban policies at the level of these districts. And, uh, uh, and uh, this is, let's say, uh, a lesson from COVID uh, uh, in the face um, that we, um, we have to, uh, to provide comprehensive responses to, to, to residents, whether to, to, to pre protect their health and, and also to be able to guarantee access to essential ser services and um, uh, ensure that 
that they can work or that we we need also for example to co-organize volunteer volunteer work etc this is something um uh, very important for us that we learn from uh, from the from the crisis which is a very good thing because you are not limiting yourself to silo view or uh, silo perspective and you are trying to interconnect all the areas and bring into the game also yeah. the citizens yeah i can i can uh, you know agree with that approach a lot um, maybe let me ask Thomas now uh, how you see the usage of modern technologies for the benefit of protecting trees or green areas in Levin. And do your citizens, you know, take interest in how the situation is and what will be the precautions uh, to secure a better future in this area? Well, climate change was a very important topic during the elections of 2018. So our citizens really expect us to do something. And it's in two levels. At one side, you have uh, preventing climate change, but at the other side, you also have climate adaptation. And if I can only give one example, I'll give an example there. Uh, we did a citizen science project there in, in cooperation with the university, where we asked citizens if they were would put weather stations in their garden and we would come off and place them. But citizens were able to decide where these weather stations would be placed. And it allowed us to get a map, a nice overview. You can find it in, at leuven.cool, um, which shows you uh, how warm it is at different places in the city. And then you say, OK, that's not very important. But it actually kind of is, uh, because definitely with the summer heating up, we find out that certain spaces in the city get more warmer, often places where there is more concrete. And this data allows us to more proactively scan for these situations because they're actually a danger to, uh, to the health of people. And uh, we say, OK, we get, we, uh, we're going to use less concrete there, put more grass, put more trees there. And we can base that actually then on the data of this uh, project where we find out where it's, it is too hot and where it's not too hot. Yeah, thank you. We have uh, the same uh, in Paris. We have exactly the same application in Paris. We we know street by street uh, the weather during summer, for example. That's cool. So maybe could you fill in us a little bit more? Are you using any special techniques like uh, white roofs or maybe green roofs in some areas or where the buildings have the carrying capacity to have those elements integrated or maybe even green facades? Just for us, this is important to have this uh, this cartography because uh, uh, this is also this this is we have an impact on, uh, for example, what kind of buildings we're going to renovate, and um, we our decision on which or social uh, buildings we're going to renovate and isolate uh, from others because we, we, we know, we exactly know which building is more hot than the other. Yeah, so this is also a great example of how, how you can use the data in a perfect way. Now, I know that Mr. Mayor of Prague was running for his office three years ago with the claim that he wants to plant one million new trees in the upcoming eight years. So we have five more, five more years to go, and I think we are getting close to the midtime. Now, um, we have also, um, approved the climate plan for the city of Prague and it goes well hand in hand and there are you know 69 measures from all different areas but maybe still one million trees that is something that you can really count you know unlike many other measures that are being taken regularly and where you do not have a clear example of the CO2 diminishment one million trees how do you see it? Do you, do you, do you find it easy to uh, explain to the citizens? And what's your, what's your take on that? Well, uh, we have already planted uh, more than 400,000 trees. So we are on the track, I would say, uh, to plant 1 million in eight years, because uh, we have done that for three years now. So uh, yes, and this number uh, has a counter on the Pragozor website and I hope it will be updated soon because I think now it's uh, showing a slightly uh, lower number but it should be updated and uh, the problem is that uh, I think in the previous years the, uh, we haven't sort of inherited uh, much data about the greenery in fact 
whereas there is a lot of sensors on transport in the city uh, for the, let's say, the public transport, I mean, people counters in, let's say, the underground stations and, other, and elsewhere as well. Uh, there are um, counters for the cars on certain points of the streets. I think we have a sort of lack of data about the greenery actually in the city. So this is something that we could definitely get inspiration for example, from, from Paris. And uh, uh, this is for sure about the way how to, how to involve uh, the citizens into the process. Of course, tree planting and our public planting events are definitely a way how to uh, get people into the thing. Yeah. And, but we are doing many other things. For example, we have a Prague Innovation Hackathon which is, uh, uh, I think, one of the, or maybe the only, actually, urban hackathon in Czech Republic. And uh, the topic of uh, ecological topics are one of the, uh, one of the pod topics uh, which have... Uh, They're resonating with the young people, especially. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, definitely very popular. Uh, among the people who uh, register for the hackathon. So uh, apart from uh, in the fact there are startups connected to the, to the uh, space agency, we are trying also to approach this from, a, let's say, lower level. Now, uh, I couldn't prevent asking this question. I already indicated that, you know, I was a little bit into it at the beginning, so Penelope, um, I understand from your profile that you served as the CEO for French Greenpeace for five years, and really, I, I have to ask that, sorry about that. What's the take, what's the experience that you brought from your, let me put it this way, activist past to the high politics, if I can call it this, this way? And was there also space for data and talking about data where you were in the lead of French Greenpeace? Well, it was a long time ago. First, first it was in the in the 80s. So, uh, well, um, it, it's it's a long time ago. I think it was it has been a fantastic experience. It was a uh, I was the ED of Greenpeace France. Uh, uh, well, when the, the French president um, decided to restart the nuclear testing in 1995, so. Uh, was a hard job and uh, I think that we were at the beginning of the data and everything. I think that we were the first organization to have uh, our own internet system. Um, and I think that's not that's quite easy to um, well to pass from being an activist to uh, making politics because in, in in a way you're doing the same thing you know you're acting for people you're acting for the planet you're acting for climate and the way to do it is quite a little bit different it's sometimes a little bit different well but I think that I keep um, as the mayor of Paris and Hidalgo we keep and we're always talking the saying the same thing you know we we never want to um, to give it to give it up we really uh, when, when we decide to do something we do it and well there is so many people who tell you well it's going to be difficult it's going to be complicated it's not possible you know and each time someone is saying it's not possible it was like the same that when I was an activist, I said, no, there is nothing impossible. We have to find a way and we find a way. This is, well, you have to be, when, when you're dealing with uh, polit public, public affairs, you know, you have to keep in your mind why you're doing it and you're doing it only for people and for the, for the planet. And if you keep that in your mind, you can do very, very, very different things and you can win. That is so very, very true. We never should forget about the citizens yeah. and about the people who gave us the chance to change something about, about the society or about our city, whatever it is. Uh, similarly to Penelope, I have an individual question to Thomas. Uh, you mentioned a quite a uh, few times that you are impl implementing some science projects that you are also using the so-called nudging techniques. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. And I know that you also prepared some live demonstration of your data. So please feel free to use up your time. 
Yeah, well, um, I'll, I'll just talk about it now because uh, um, one of the issues in Leuven is that we have a lot of students. I said 50,000 students and 100,000 inhabitants. And students, well, they like to party. It's allowed. We, we are, uh, definitely, since COVID restrictions got a little bit lower, uh, I, I got a lot of emails from people saying, this has to stop, all this noise. I'm staying awake. And they often contain a lot of capital letters and a lot of exclamation points. And <laughs> I understand that. I do understand that. Of course, if you go live above a bar, I don't understand that. But if you live in a quiet street and suddenly at night someone starts screaming because they're drunk, that's very annoying. Uh, we have a lot of those problems because um, we have the city center where you can go out and then the student flats who are around the city. And we have what we call uh, go through streets. People go through these streets. After they, they drink in their student flats, then they're drunk, they go to the city center to party. Underway, they make a lot of noise. Then after the party, they go back and they also make a lot of noise. So it's a very big problem that affects the health of people because being awoken in your sleep is something very unhealthy, actually. And so we try to do something, but you see what I'm talking about. This It seems like I'm not talking about data, but I am. Just give me a second. We start from the problem. And so we say, okay, we want to do something. And so we were going to contact with this nudging firm and they said, oh yeah, we can solve this. We're going to put uh, mats in front of the doors and put pa hang paintings on walls. And so this will all feel more housey. And I was like, might work, but I will never know if it works because maybe complaints will go down because people are tired of complaining. I, don't, I just don't know if it works. And I want to know if my policies work. I want to do data-driven policy making. So what we did is we uh, put a tender in the market and we found a partner who, f who has put microphones in the street. Kind of like this. Microphones like this. But of course, the difference is they don't record any voices. What they do is they measure decibels, they measure frequency. And that's very, very, very interesting because uh, it allows us to see how loud it is in the street at any time and also in different parts of the street. But of course, that's not enough. We also need to know which noises are actually a nuisance and which are not. So we designed like an app, actually a little web page that people have on their phone. Uh, and whenever they are woken, they just have to say, I got awoken by this kind of noise, enter. That's it. That's all they have to do. But that way, we involve citizens in the project. And we can actually see which kind of frequencies correspond to noises that wake you up. Because uh, a truck can be very loud, has a lot of decibels, but is less likely to wake you up than someone who screams at, at the same level. So we, we are now working together uh, with scientists to see which data actually corresponds to, uh, to nightly noises that can wake people up so that we can say, okay, there was three instances at 2 a.m. and five instances at 4 a.m. and so on and so on. And then we can start our experiments. Starting January, we will do those experiments, those nudging techniques, and that's very interesting because now we will see, do they work, don't they work, because we we'll, can compare to data when those techniques were not there. And secondly, we can do some information campaigns and see uh, if those work. But thirdly, and that's, in my opinion, the most interesting part, but because then we're really using technology. Actually, what we can do is whenever there's a spike in noise, we can make some automatic actions occur. For example, something we we're planning to do is a projection that occurs on the street the moment the noise is too loud, and it says, watch out, you can get a fine. We don't know if it works, but we will find out because we have the data. Another thing is LED strips at the inside of uh, the windows so that whenever someone makes noise, the lights will go on, on the insides of houses. But then people will, in their drunk stupor, they don't want to make noise, but they just don't realize that they're still so loud. So they will just realize, oh, I've woken someone up. And so this will be very interesting. And we can also use, and even if those techniques don't work, or not, can't remove all the noise, we can predict when there will be noise based on the data that we have, and therefore uh, do police interventions at the right time of night so because now it's something very ungraspable. People who are too loud. When are you need, do you need to be there? How can you punish them? It's very hard. With this data, we are able to be there at the right time and waste as few police resources as possible to uh, keep this problem from happening. So the answer is, and the solution is gamification. You are not using any electroshock techniques, obviously. But this brings me to the idea, we have just recently started implementing uh, a project which is called the Sentiment Map or Pocitová Mapa in Prague. 
what is your experience, Zdenek, so far with the sentiment map and how do you find it interesting and relevant for the city planning? Well, uh, uh, Penelope just said that they've got uh, 17 arrondissements, 17 districts in Prague. Well, we've got uh, 57 districts in Prague and we feel that uh, uh, maybe the city is um, quite fragmented in this way. However, uh, why I'm talking about it is because the sentiment map is actually uh, focused towards the city districts who are, let's say, the primary users of the map. So there is certainly, I would say, different experience which depends on the attitude of that particular city district. So I know, for example, Prague 10 or Prague 11 is uh, definitely using the map. Uh, they are working with the citizens. However, there are also other districts who are not that much keen to using this kind of technique to cooperate with the citizens. However, I think that such a tool is definitely much more usable on the level of the city districts because they are definitely closer to the people and this is about uh, the problems uh, which are local in their, uh, in their uh, nature. And uh, because these problems which are reported are solvable on the local level uh, and this is the tool that could definitely help. Thanks. Now let me ask uh, our timekeeper how much time do we actually have left? Do we have to finish by uh, half past or do we have a little bit more time since we started later on? Uh, I just, I need to leave, I, I need to leave and I, I will say bye to everybody and uh, well. So uh, maybe one, love, one last, love to one last love sentence. To I really, uh, I really like to to continue to uh, well to, to to work with uh, with cities to improve our our pol well our political uh, and uh, subjects on, on data and maybe uh, well we can organize and have uh, other talks to uh, well to be able to 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 more you know, coming in details to to exactly uh, understand what we are doing. Or, and I think that could be interesting because we're not reinventing in, in our own space. Thank you so much, Penelope, for joining us. So uh, now we will excuse you. It's a goodbye and a big clap for you. And we might use a couple more minutes for our two remaining guests, if you don't mind. So a big clap for Penelope. <laughs> Um, my two final questions that I wanted to ask were directed towards the vision of the future. And I would not want to miss that because I find that quite relevant and important. First one, um, lately we have been talking a lot about working on long-term projects and with long-term visions, not just in Prague, obviously, it happens everywhere. And the classical problem, that is, uh, as it happens in politics, is that most of the very complicated challenges cannot be resolved just within one political term, within the four years. And unless you get re-elected, which might get tricky sometimes, some of your work may be wasted after the four years. Um, my question is, how do you think that data can help to overcome this information or you know, popularity Cambridge gap? Cambridge Analytics. Cambridge Analytica, yeah, thank you. No need to go, go on asking any longer. No, I'm serious. So. What makes a good project that cannot be easily cancelled by the possibly newly coming political representation? And how do you think is um, it relevant to start from, from the beginning to, to make the project so relevant that no one will ever dare to cancel it? You may ask. Uh, you may start, sorry. Okay. Um, so, yeah, first of all, I'm very lucky. Uh, where I'm from, terms last six years. So oh. it gives me a bit more time to get things done. But your question is very interesting. And it was something that I was thinking about myself as well and, uh, when I started my term. And I was very much in favor of being, creating this big data lake and just throwing everything in there, putting everything online and thinking that something will come of it. 
But of course, the moment that I leave office, that's the first thing that they're going to abolish if it's not used. So that's why I'm starting more from what data should we generate that is also being used. Because think about, the, for example, the mobility data that's also visible for the public. Uh, that's not something that will go away ever, ever, ever because citizens want, the, want those data. They want uh, to know things because they are used to knowing things and then nobody will be able to, uh, to take that away. Um, so you have to involve citizens. You have to communicate also about the data. If every year I talk about how much, uh, for example, waste that we have collected and recycled, my pre, my, my, the one who comes after me will have to do the same because it's starting to be an expectation. So uh, that's something that you, you, you have to communicate, communicate, communicate on it. Uh, that's my, at least that's my opinion. And in that way, you are able to make it an expectation that you have that. Also, I think that the more that you take decisions and base yourself on numbers for that, uh, and the more that people will start to expect that from everything when it comes after you. Think about the COVID crisis, for example. We see that today. That, uh, I don't think there ever has been a crisis where so much data and information was produced uh, that was able to help legislators to make some decisions, but was also able to make legislators responsible for their decisions. And I think if there would ever come a legis uh, legislator that would say, oh, this COVID data, we're gonna stop collecting them, the public would go be angry. Journalists will ask very tough questions. So using data in your conversation as a politician will make sure that the data will keep being collected. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this was the secret recipe of the city of Leuven. What's the secret recipe of the mayor of Prague? Well, for sure, uh, I think that the best way is to actually do less with uh, and invest more into the marketing. Um, which makes the things to be used more and therefore uh, you can focus on, let's say, less rabbits and not chase too many rabbits on the field. And, uh, and But uh, somehow it appears that it's got some sort of equilibrium, uh, an equilibrium um, uh, sort of uh, behavior because for example, we started our website, new website, uh, Portal Prajana, which is a portal of the Prague citizen, and uh, we haven't yet invested uh, a lot of uh, finance into the marketing, which means it was not visited that much. However, when the media started to talk about the fact it's not visited that much, it started to attract the people. And so uh, when now when so everyone... That's a great example of the negative marketing, yeah. Yeah, but still marketing. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so even this sort of marketing can actually attract the users and uh, make the thing more used and therefore more attractive and therefore uh, I believe that this website will definitely will uh, be developed in the future uh, years because definitely this is the way this is the way to go. And uh, yes, we have also a website who have been uh, invested uh, into I mean the marketing uh, side of the project, and that is, for example, the COVID uh, web, which is COVID. Uh, praha.eu and that was a website that was actually the mostly visited website of uh, the Prague uh, municipality like ever and uh, which means it was uh, used a lot and it was also a job of our uh, data team of uh, the data platform Golemio and uh, it helped people to find the nearest and the most accessible sampling point for the COVID uh, virus. And it looks like it's going to be uh, used again, unfortunately. So the secret recipe of the city of Prague is to maybe start a new crisis and create an artificial need for well, the that's service. Not, and, that's and not the work. good interpretation of what I said. But uh, let's say uh, the, the secret recipe is actually to uh, invest uh, enough into the marketing of the, of the digital projects because sometimes we focus only on the, on the technical side of the thing and we neglect the marketing issues and that the users. 
are very recognizable. Yes, and that's not good. Thank you. Gentlemen, my final question. And again, I could not help but asking this question. Uh, I'm interested about your take for the vision of your city that um, would be the idea how your city might look in maybe 10 years, 20 years from now. If you had a magical wand, imagine you had one, uh, what would be the one thing that you would change now and how would you envision your city in 2030? So let's say less than 10 years ahead from now. Thomas. Well, there's so much that I, I would want to change, of course. Uh, that's why I'm into politics. But if I had to choose one thing and I would will take something with data, um, then I will want not it. You won't see it. You you walk through the city and everything will be the same. But our citizens are more informed. They know uh, what the situation is on many different topics because they are informed not only by the media but also by themselves. They have data which they can access. They can discuss amongst themselves and base the data on it. We see that now during the COVID crisis, to say the thing again, so many discussions at family tables and people will look at websites. They will look up numbers to, to, uh, to make their argument, to make their point. And I hope that's something that we'll do not only for this crisis, but that we learn from and that when people talk about are enough trees being planted, that they will look on the website of the PRA and that they will find, yes, we already planted 400,000 trees, so we're on track. And that, that this whole idea of, uh, of not just saying, yeah, I don't feel like there are a lot of trees being planted, that we can get rid of that and that we can talk more about facts and numbers and that that's not something we just only do in politics and in the media, but in dinner tables around the, uh, the city. And that's why I know there are many people busy with data here in this room and online. And that's why I want to thank you and tell you how important your work is, because it allows us as policymakers to make better decisions. But in the end, it will also allow citizens to be better informed and be more understanding of what's happening in their city and in the world. So thank you for that. Yeah, I have to express my gratitude to all of you, to all the data analysts and data processors as well, because your work is really indispensable for all of us. Now, a magical wand in the hands of Mayor of Prague. Well, originally I wanted to say that I want more trees in the city, but uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, when I'm thinking uh, what, what Thomas said, just said, uh, it's definitely true, uh, because the problem of the disinformation campaigns uh, is definitely a problem that will not uh, last if we do not do something about it and uh, I believe that the use of the data or actually data transformed into comprehensible information is definitely an access uh, which are accessible in a simple way uh, is definitely a way how to uh, deal with this disinformation and bring the public discussion about the reasons of various problems. For example, why do not we have enough trees in the, in the you know, World War? What's the reason why we do have traffic jams in our city and so on? Uh, this could definitely bring the public discussion back to reality because sometimes it's definitely uh, completely out of reality. And those were the final words of Mr. Mayor is the negative of the city of Prague. Now let me close this session, the city's talk within the Prague City Data Congress 2021. Thank you everyone for your great attention. Hello to the viewers of the stream. And once again, many thanks to the negative, to Thomas van Opens and Penelope Comitas who had to leave us a little bit earlier, but we still like her. Thank you.